All right, it looks like we are ready to go for our first garden hour of the season as I open up the participants, get the little window off of my eyeballs. It's great to be back. <laughs> How is everybody doing this evening out there in Zoom land? As you saw on the little intro, uh, you can ask us questions. You can put those in the Q&A. But first, we're going to introduce ourselves and give you a little bit of a heads up on how Garden Hour is going to work. So my name is Amanda Bachman. I'm the Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist for SDSU Extension. I'm based in the Peer Regional Center. Excuse me. And tonight I'm going to go over some things that we saw over the winter and a little bit of an outlook on some cool insects that are going to be moving into South Dakota, hopefully soon. And joining me tonight are sort of the original Fab Four of Garden Hour. We have Dr. Rhoda Burrows, who is our horticulture state specialist out in Rapid City. Hi, Rhoda. What are you going to be sharing with us tonight? I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the eternal question. Is it time to plant yet? Awesome. I had a question today about soil temperature and I looked at the map and my answer was no. <laughs> so we'll see if I was right. We also have Dr. Christine Lang, who is another one of our horticulture state specialists based on campus in Brookings, so the other side of the state. Christine, what is in store for us tonight from you? Well, um, it's going to be a little bit of a indoor and outdoor plant grab bag, and um, Rhoda will probably reprimand me for starting some things too early, but we'll see. We, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And finally, we have Dr. John Ball, our state forestry and tree specialist, also based on campus. Currently, he's in Brookings, but I know he joins us during garden hour from all sorts of places across the state. He's kind of hiding in the shadows like a Sith Lord. John, what are you going to cover for us tonight? I like that connection. I'm a Sith Lord too now. <laughs> hey, up. Hi, John Ball. I'm actually based out of a truck. I drive the whole state every week, so that's how you find me, and I'm simply the tree guy. Uh, you know what? I might talk a little bit about planting too, because I'm getting a lot of those soil temperatures. But really, my focus tonight is everybody knows this is the year of the rabbit. And that was true in South Dakota. So that's a big part of what I'll be discussing tonight the attack of the bunnies. Awesome. I feel like a missed opportunity. I should have absolutely put something about voles in my presentation because that was another thing that we got a ton of questions about. So if someone wants to volunteer to talk about voles on a week that I'm not here, go for it. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just thinking back to where we were, the questions that we were getting sort of before the season started. And so for those of you watching along at home, you can see in the chat, that's where we'll put some information, maybe some links, so keep an eye out there. There might be some stuff to click on if you want some further information or other info on how to contact us. But if you have a yard or garden question for us this evening, you can use that Q&A button. If you're on a laptop, that's gonna be sort of on the bottom of your screen. Um, right next to the chat button. So feel free to click on that and you could submit a question with your name or you can submit a question anonymously. But I am gonna go ahead and share my screen because I'm gonna kick this one off talking about some bugs that we've been seeing. And... Okay. This is our first one. Can you guys see my correct presenter view? Yes. Yes. Awesome. I'm not going to get too cocky because that's never going to work the right way again throughout the rest of the season. But starting out with, so this is the insect. This is my most frequently asked insect during the months of pretty much from November until about April. This is called a picture wing fly, and my apologies for not including something for scale there, but that fly is about the size of sort of your traditional stereotypical house fly that a lot of people are familiar with. These picture wing flies spend, they don't necessarily spend the entire winter indoors, but they do move inside in the fall. So if you've heard me talk in previous seasons about those fall invaders, uh, picture wing flies are one of those insects. 
they come inside through, you know, holes in screens, soffits, whatever, and they kind of go unnoticed until you have some warm days during the winter, and then they get active and, you know, start looking for maybe a way to get back outside and uh, continue their life cycle. However, they usually don't find the way that they entered, and then I get calls from people wondering why they have so many flies in their house. So the good news is that these flies are not feeding or reproducing indoors, so if you see them, you don't have to worry that there's, you know, something dead in the walls. They are truly just a nuisance. Um, if you did experience these over the winter, uh, my condolences and also hello again if you joined us because I'm sure I talked to you. Um, but a vacuum cleaner is pretty much the best defense against them as far as sucking up the dead insects. And then also, as you're starting your spring home repairs, take a look at places they might have been entering and start working on making those fixes so that next fall you have fewer insects coming indoors to spend the winter with you. It is definitely time to think about spring insect management. A lot of things that were overwintering as adults are starting to be active um, if they aren't already. And this is a zoomed in picture of a wasp uh, that was actually inside my house. Uh, the wasp queens will overwinter. Uh, the rest of the workers don't, those don't make it, but the wasp queens are what survive. This is one that I found in about April, so she came out a little bit early and I had to trap her before my cats discovered the spicy sky raisin. I did toss her back outside, so I don't know if she made it through um, any of our late spring blizzards, but if she did, now is the time that these wasps are starting to fly around and look for sites to start building their nests. I get a lot of questions from people in the fall, especially August, September timeframe, wondering how do I get rid of this wasp nest? And that's the point where the wasp nest is like the biggest it's gonna be for the entire year. Now is the time, if you see wasps building a nest, someplace that you don't want them, now's the time to be knocking down that nest and discouraging that behavior. Don't procrastinate on this because they will get bigger and more robust and then you're just gonna wanna leave them alone until it freezes. I'm also pro wasp, so I maybe have a little bit of a different tolerance for these ladies than other people do, but keep an eye out, especially as you start doing your yard work and notice where you see wasps maybe flying in and out of the eaves or soffits or behind shutters on your house. So another critter that is waking up from its long winter slumber, uh, the ticks, the ticks are out. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to everybody with dogs. This is your public service announcement to make sure you're visiting your vet, doing what you need to do to get those flea and tick treatments on your animals. Reports from my colleagues as far north as Aberdeen even, which we'll talk about later as the frozen tundra, were getting ticks on their dogs. So now is absolutely the time to think about those treatments. And if you've got dogs that are out running around, absolutely check them when they come back inside because the ticks are active and especially the newly hatched ticks are really small. <laughs> so this is a picture of a female American dog tick. As adults, they're pretty large, about the size of, you know, about an apple seed, maybe a little bit smaller. So the adults are very visible, but the, the immatures, the nymphs are can be pretty tiny. And if you're somebody who's maybe in the southeastern point of South Dakota, you might even be in uh, black legged tick range. And those little tiny baby ticks are, you know, like poppy seed size. So get your flea and tick treatments started. And if you are outside hiking around, if your animals are outside hiking around, if you're foraging for uh, mushrooms or asparagus or anything, absolutely don't skimp on the tick protection. I will show the uh, tick ranges for some of our species of sort of human health importance. Obviously the American dog tick on the left there, that is our most common tick, most widespread in South Dakota. It does vector some diseases, but it's not one that we get super worried about as far as being a disease vector to humans. Um, however, the two ticks on the right, on the bottom, we've got the black-legged tick, which I mentioned earlier. That is the tick that vectors Lyme disease. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and that was black-legged tick and Lyme disease country. 
Uh, there are some treatments emerging for Lyme disease, but it's definitely not something that you want to get. So do make sure that if you are in sort of that eastern third of South Dakota, especially, that you are taking precautions against ticks. And that includes, you know, long sleeve pants, long sleeve shirts. I know it's not super warm out yet, but I have seen people walking around in shorts. Um, and using a, an EPA registered um, active ingredient insect repellent. So don't go out there with just the essential oils because you will smell great, but the ticks won't care and they will still get on you. And I also included the Lone Star tick up there. That is one that you can see its range is starting to potentially include the southeasternmost tip of South Dakota. And Lone Star tick is the one that vectors the alpha-gal syndrome, where you become allergic to red meat. So if you enjoy steak, perhaps take extra precautions when it comes to ticks this summer so you can continue to enjoy it for years to come until your cardiologist maybe tells you not to. So moving on from the critters that nobody kind of wants to see, I did want to touch a little bit on the monarch butterflies because I know a lot of people are always really looking forward to when they are going to show up in South Dakota. And this is a map from the website called Journey North. So you can actually, you know, go to that website. And if you see a monarch, you can actually submit your sighting and it will be included on the map, which is pretty cool. And you can see that so far, the monarchs are into about central Nebraska and not a whole lot of observations yet. So they are starting to head our way. Uh, I hope they wait a little bit because there's not a lot flowering right now. I have not seen any uh, milkweed sprouts in my yard yet. It's still a little bit early, but they are making their way north. Uh, populations over the winter were not super huge. So there has been some concern that the populations coming out of Mexico and Texas, you know, aren't super robust, but I'm hoping, hoping that they will sort of recover as they encounter more blooming plants and more uh, milkweed on their way to us. So we should see them in probably three or four weeks, usually by early June at the latest. And my final slide, since I will not be on garden hour the next two weeks, I've got some other commitments. I did want to touch on No Mo May because it is now May 2nd and the posts are making the rounds on social media about how you're not supposed to mow in May in order to uh, protect the pollinators. I get it, it's a catchy slogan, but if you're also trying to manage your turf, um, not mowing for the entire month of May, I would need to take like a scythe to my lawn if I waited until June 1st. Instead, it's not quite as catchy, it's a little bit more of a mouthful, but how about mow high May? Um, set your mower to its highest setting so that you're clearing the tops of things like dandelions or violets so that you're gonna be leaving those flowers out there. Um, but you're still managing your turf. Uh, I've, my grass has finally kind of started to come back after the winter and I've got some sections that are really long already. And the dandelions that I actually have blooming are fairly stumpy still. So if I set my mower on the highest setting, I can still, you know, cut my turf back a little bit and then also um, still have flowers left over when I'm done for the bees. And one of the things with the Nomo May is trying to conserve those early floral resources. If you want to make sure that you've got flowers uh, for the bumblebees and other bees out there early, you can make sure to plant more early blooming plant, plants or also include some uh, flowering trees and shrubs. There are things like, you know, forsythia or crab apples, things that are going to be flowering earlier than some of our herbaceous plants. So I'm okay with it if you want to mow your grass in May. You know, I'm, I'm, I think that's fine. Go for it. <laughs> so I'm going to stop my share and take a quick look at the Q&A. Looks like we are good there. And I am going to hand things off to Dr. Rhoda Burroughs. So Rhoda. I've got one question for you. Oh, Amanda. okay. Um, I, somebody recently told me the reason for the no mo may was ground nesting bees. That's interesting. That was, a, that was a new one to me. <laughs> yeah. So garden cleanup, you know, still hurt, hold your horses on cleaning up like stems and stuff like hollow stems, dried stems that are in your garden because until the 
nighttime temperatures are sort of consistently in the 50s, you still are going to have uh, bees that are in those stems that haven't emerged yet. If you really want to remove the stems, you can like remove them, but just like put them in a pile like on your property still, like don't burn them or mulch them or chip them or do anything like that. Um, but yeah, so the ground nesting bees, you know, they're still just like tillage. Tillage is also what you don't want to do. Uh, mowing, I would think is fine for them. It's just, you don't want to be disturbing the soil or for those ones that are using stems, you don't want to be destroying those stems too early. Um, I usually wait until about Memorial Day to go like hardcore on my garden work in pier, much probably to the chagrin of my neighbors. Um, but that gives critters plenty of time to, you know, leave their hiding places. And also some of the stuff that's come back up gives me time for it to get big enough so I know what it is. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, I will see if I'm as competent as Amanda was at sharing slides. Do I have that right or wrong? Yep, looks good. Okay, looks good. <laughs> Thank you. So Amanda and, and John were talking about 24 hour or soil temperatures. And I grabbed this off the uh, climate.sdstate.edu website this afternoon. And this is not the coldest temperature. It it's, uh, seems to be kind of a average of the day. So we've got 38 uh, degrees up here in Bodo. 48, I'm guessing might be high more. And you can see up in that northeast corner that we're still in the 40s uh, for soil temperatures. Now, this is bare ground uh, soil temperature at four inches depth. So, uh, probably under sod, it's a little cooler there yet. But, um, and the rest of the state is pretty much in the 50s. So, uh, I've seen some comments about, is it too late to plant potatoes? No, uh, most of you can plant them other than that cold spot up in the center of the state. Uh, but you want to plant them before the soil temperatures are staying above 70. So we've got a good month probably before we have to worry about not planting anymore. Um, and just to comment, seedless water and beans are really probably one of the most cold sensitive of the uh, vegetable seeds. And there you want to make sure that the soil temperatures have reached at least 60 degrees and are staying there fairly consistently. So that's usually in the May uh, into June. Looking at the same website, uh, it gives you options of, of choosing all kinds of things. And you can also uh, click on a dot and, and uh, have the information for that station pop up and, and even uh, uh, webcam if that location has one. So it's kind of fun to play with. But um, this was a 24 hour low temperature last night. So you see, we've got plenty of 20s in the state yet. 21, I think it was the coldest. And I'm not sure they show that. I would think this would be rapid, but we were quite a bit warmer than 21. So maybe it's up in the hills. Um, but you can see we've got to hold off a little bit yet before we plant those uh, non-hardy crops. And even the hardy ones. Um, I planted peas last week, and I'm pretty sure they'll be fine by the time they get up. Um, looking at, at low temperature tolerance, uh, some of the crops that, that are hardiest are things like the coal crops, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, uh, kale, uh, corn salad, collards, carrots, parsley, and spinach. Parsley and spinach are one where the seeds will germinate at just about the coldest temperature of all, all the seeds. So you could easily 
put out your spinach now. Um, and like I said, I, I went ahead and planted peas and I'm fairly confident that I'll be fine with that. Um, how cold can you get with these cool season crops? A lot of them will go down as cool as 26 degrees and be able to survive. They might show some damage, uh, but they'll but they'll survive. Uh, if it's something like lettuce, maybe don't want to do that yet because even if it survives, you don't want to have uh, damaged looking leaves since those are what you're actually eating. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, those crops like broccoli and, and cauliflower that produce the heads on the plant, um, if they're in extended cold, and we're talking here probably low 40s for two or three days, uh, that can cause the plant to get too eager to form a flower, and it forms it too soon. And so instead of getting a nice solid head of broccoli or of cauliflower, uh, you can end up with what we call buttoning, which is sort of this loose, um, makes it easy to, to uh, chop apart for, for your salad, but uh, you won't get nearly the yield you might have if it had been a nice big head. Uh, just to show you what some cold damage can look like, because it does uh, get confused sometimes with maybe a bacterial disease or, or even sunburn. In both these cases, uh, this is lettuce on the left and a cold crop up on the, the right here. Uh, this was both cold damage, so probably mid to upper 20s uh, on, these, on these two plants or if they weren't uh, hardened off beef and were grown as transplants, and, and even 30 degrees can do some damage uh, if the plants aren't hardened off to that temperature. Uh, one of the things we notice with lettuce, uh, it, this could very easily be mistaken for, for disease of some sort with these brown spots, but you also get sometimes some water soaking and the cuticle is actually separating a little bit from the leaf or the epidermis from the lower levels of the leaf. And that's why you get these sort of, uh, sometimes they almost look like leaf minor damage. Uh, and, and all that can be cold damage. Uh, this was a sample that was brought into my office this morning. Uh, it's a rhubarb leaf uh, just starting to come out and a person was concerned because they have had spots on their rhubarb leaves and and uh, the last few years and we really don't have fungicides for homeowners that will will do much for uh, some of the fungal spots mostly that get on rhubarb. It's mostly a case of doing cleanup if you've seen uh, spots on your leaves the past few years. Be sure to clean up those old leaves at the end of the season and take them away from there because that's where the spores for the next year's infection will come from. Um, and also you may need to divide up your your plant and spread it out a little bit more so it gets a little bit uh, better air movement and, and can mine some fresh soil for nutrients. However, this actually, I don't believe, is a disease. Um, for one thing, it's pretty early to have this kind of, of uh, fungal activity. And we would think it would be fungal because it is going across the veins. But the other thing is, um, it tends to be a little bit more on the outer side of the leaf. Um, and, and often fungi and bacterial uh, diseases will start where there's a little bit of a water caught because they need water for the spores to germinate and infect. And this, um, instead of being down in the in the valleys of the leaves, <clears throat> we're up on the on the mountaintops, and and I'll show you. 
I took a leaf and squeezed it. And you could see as the leaf was developing, sort of before it unfolded all the way, that's where all the damage was up on those ridges. And so I'm pretty certain that this was actually just cold damage uh, rather than rather than a disease. And so not much to do about it. Uh, watch the newer leaves and see how they look as, as it warms up and the plant starts growing more. Uh, and I, finally, I just wanted to put a plug in for for one of our resources if you have not found it yet on our extension website um, and you can go to extension.sdstate.edu and that will get you into their extension website and then and then make the following selections in the drop down menus and you'll come to how to grow it and we've got i think about a dozen uh, vegetables up here and each one um, gives a brief overview of how how to grow it and also includes information like when to plant <laughs> so uh, so if you're kind of wondering is, is it time to plant green beans yet is it time to plant beets yet it'll give you some some good tips about that and with that i will stop sharing i think yep <laughs> all right thank you rhoda and I took a look at the Q&A and it looks like the question that came in, uh, Christine wants to answer. So we will okay. hold off on that one until. Well, I was going to say, actually, I want to pitch it to Rhoda so we can oh, co answer okay. it, <laughs> if I might interject. All right, so, Rhoda friends, go for it. <laughs> Rhoda, buckle up. It's a bit of a long one, but it ties very nicely to a project we're starting already. Uh -huh. um, so. The gist of it is someone wants to kill a large area of lawn so that they can establish a native grass planting. And they've been collecting a lot of cardboard boxes. They've got black plastic. They have sandbags that need to be filled. And so their current plan is to soak that cardboard, put it out over the grass, then put the plastic over it, hold it down with the sandbags. And they're wondering our take or feedback on that. And um, given the fact that we've got a graduate student working on soil tarping, right. um, I was going to pitch that to you. And I, you know, thought we could discuss it a little bit for the group. <laughs> sure. And this was Yankton, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. This is in <laughs> Yankton. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that you need to think about in terms of you can kill the grass, but if you've got seeds in there yet, uh, those may uh, come back when you're at the same time that you're starting to reseed the other. Mm -hmm. So so just a word of warning about that from my own experience. <laughs> uh, in my case, I used Roundup uh, with a couple applications over, over time. And, Probably I wouldn't do that now. Um, I might choose instead to go the blackout method if you think your neighbors can tolerate it. But <laughs> um, yeah. once you take the tarps off, you might want to uh, go through with the rotor tiller and then wait a couple weeks and then do that again just to catch any seedlings, weeds that might have come in through that time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Rhoda, when I was reading, I'm kind of inclined to suggest to this person forgo the cardboard and just tarp it, untarp it, do the tillage, and then retarp it again to get that flush of weeds versus having that cardboard mess to deal with. Would you agree with that? Probably. <laughs> the more you pile up, the more there is for the wind to catch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, as, as we've experienced very readily with our tarps. Yeah, yeah, and that I was going to say, if you plan on laying out these tarps, uh, maybe start early in the morning when it's slightly calmer. <laughs> and I think the best advice Rhoda and I can give based on our recent experience with our graduate student who is um, using so tarps on soils is maybe fill more sandbags than you think you're going to need. Um, because you don't want to have to chase the tarp down the highway, or in our case, we really didn't want to see it like plastered against the football stadium or um, out 
on the interstate. So just, I would encourage you with soil tarping more sandbags and get it nice and tight um, so that wind can't get underneath and cause any problems for you. And I guess the great news is, Rhoda, that we can talk more about soil tarping for folks once we start getting some data or some photos of what we're up to here in Brookings. Yep, we're putting on another layer this week, I believe, right? Yep. Um, so we have a study where we're going to, that Rhoda's leading with our graduate student, and we're going to be tarping for six weeks, four weeks, and two weeks ahead of planting onions because we hate our lives and decide to pick a <laughs> difficult to weed crop. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. Can't wait to see the pictures, especially, and maybe take some video so we can have some outtakes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> when you said plan, plan ahead and, and, and get the benefit of our experience, I thought you were going to say, and have lots of friends ready to help. <laughs> you have lots of friends ready to help, too, especially if they're big pieces of plastic. <laughs> Well, next up, we are going to move to Dr. John Ball, who is going to give us the tree update, the degree day update, see what things are active. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Let me try to open this thing here. Uh, let's see. It's not showing up. That is a very interesting, tiny little part of your PowerPoint. All right. Let's try it again. I noticed when I tried to upload it there, it suddenly decided not to. Here we go. Let's try this. Nope. Do you have it in uh, presenter view on, on your side of things? Is this? Oh. No. Oh, wait, we can see it now. It's not right. interview, but it's uh, we can see the slides. All right. How's that? Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. All right. Who knows? It's computers. I mean, this is the only technology I know of. When you call IT, they say, well, just shut it off and start it up again. I, I hope they never say that with the aircraft. Just shut it off. See if it starts up again. So apologize for that minor blitch. We'll have many of them throughout the uh, year here. Oh, by the way, just an FYI, um, I we use the term roundup, but roundup doesn't mean what roundup used to mean. Uh, I've already ran into a couple problems last year where people said, well, I used roundup. And I said, read the label. It's not always glyphosate, which we're used to being in roundup. Roundup is kind of a name. And maybe Amanda can chat on that a little bit later uh, with some of the changes. But one of the things I always like to do here is talk a little bit about growing degree days. The needle has barely moved for Aberdeen. They're at 19. They finally made double digits. It is incredibly cold. And I was amazed when Amanda said there's ticks up there already. I, I'm not sure what they're living on. I mean, I saw a couple of woolly mammoths wandering about. Maybe they're attached to them. But otherwise, it is just cold up there. It's time has stopped. Uh, the other parts of the state are progressing fairly nicely, though we're behind where we were last year, both in soil temperature and growing degree days. So uh, you'll notice a lot of plants really haven't kicked off yet. We are getting some of the early blooming plants. Uh, the forsythias were in bloom at Macquarie Gardens. They usually kick in in about 100, 100 to 150 growing degree days. So we're starting to get that nice display, but a couple of the other early spring flowering plants, such as Cornelia and Jerry's, I couldn't even bother to take a picture of them. They haven't, the buds have not even opened. So maybe by next week, and everybody knows what springs are like in South Dakota, they last a couple of days and then we go directly into summer. So we may find a lot of our spring flowering plants condensed into about a one week time period before we uh, go into the 90s. Uh, but as I mentioned already, this is truly the year of the rabbits, which it is in the uh, Chinese calendar, but it fits very well here in South Dakota this year. Uh, the bunnies, I get pictures ev almost every day, and I'm not exaggerating, of people showing me what their plants look like or the bunnies, as we have in this case. But everything you expect them to eat, they've eaten. Uh, the purple osher willow here, you can see they've girdled it. By that, we mean have chewed completely around the stems. 
um, on the winged euonymus, also known as burning bush. The other name for this is rabbit candy. And they love this plant. You know, if someone said, gee, I wish I had more rabbits in my yard, plant this plant. Uh, but you'll find that they love it so much, they essentially kill it. And this is one that has grown for a long, long, long time um, on campus. And this year, along with everything else that wasn't moving, uh, the rabbits have just chewed away on it. So, you know, the one question I've been getting is what's caused this damage? And in this case, you can see all the little cocoa puffs on the ground around it and all the uh, bunny poop. Clearly, this is bunny. And of course, the chew marks fit that as well. They do differ from voles. But the other thing is, the other question I get is, will the plants come back? Perhaps in another life. Because what they've done this year is they've gnawed fairly deep into these plants. If they just nibble on the outer bark and a little bit into the inner bark, the phloem, where the sugars are moved, sometimes those stems can recover. Sometimes. But if they really gnaw into it, actually cutting into the sap with that's moving the water as well, usually that plant's going to die. My advice to people is don't be too quick to prune. You can wait and see what leaves out and remains leafed out because you may get plants that leaf out and then wilt because the water conducting tubes have been severed as well. Uh, but the, I mean, I looked at some plants, uh, I swore beavers were after them, uh, but no, it turned out to be bunnies. What you can do for your shrubs, which is relatively easy, is prune them back to about two to three inches above the ground. This is Arrowwood Viburnum, Cantoni Aster, Hedge Cantoni Aster is another favorite. And if you go out right now and cut them down to two inches tall, just a flat cut, they will sprout and come right back. Now, if it's a plant that flowers in the spring, you may have to forfeit those blooms this year. But many plants that bloom in the spring, the forsythias and the lilacs are not preferred bunny food. And I've seen very little damage on them. Uh, they mostly hit things like dogwoods and willows and that, where the, color, uh, the flowers are not really a key ornamental value. So go out here in this nice weekend coming up and just trim everything back to about two inches and it'll sprout. You'll actually be left with a better plant because of the bunny damage. For your small trees in that, I'm afraid you have to start over. They may sprout, but we all have to remember that the sprouts coming up around the base of your trees are actually from a different root than the top. And so you'll get a plant back, but it's probably not the plant that you bought. And squirrels. Oh my goodness, the squirrels have gone crazy. Squirrels gone wild. Uh, this is a homestead buckeye. Uh, Homestead is a South Dakota introduction, which, and what I found interesting is they wouldn't feed on the Autumn Splendor Buckeye, which is right next to them, and that's a University of Minnesota release. So apparently our squirrels have adapted to only feed on plants that were released by South Dakota State and will ignore the Minnesota plants in this case, which I found rather odd. I mean, maybe the bark of the ones from Minnesota taste like lutefisk, so they avoid them. But uh, it wasn't much of a study, so I don't want to go a lot on it, but they have gone out and done a lot of damage. Now, by the way, they've, they've chewed so deeply on these, uh, many of those branches are going to die, as you'll see here on the sugar maple. And sugar maples, they just love no matter where they're at. Uh, they're after that little bit of sap that occurs in the spring as well. But what we're seeing now is a tremendous amount of damage out there done by the twin evils, uh, bunnies and squirrels. And unfortunately, most of our management at this point is going to be with a handsaw or pruner, trying to prune off the damage and try to reconstruct the plant. What else did we have? Well, we had some pretty poor weather. It was a long winter. It was a cold winter. But we forget we had a lot of temperature fluctuations in the fall. And that was really one of our big problems. Now, this is a sensation box elder. It is a very attractive box elder. Actually does far better West River than East River. It's more of a zone five tree. But they're trying it here in Brookings, which is certainly a zone four, maybe a four A even. And, that, and when I looked at the trees here this last week, there's a lot of damage on them. They've died back. And they didn't die back from the winter. They died back from the fall. 
Uh, I could already see this damage as they were going into winter. I don't know if any of you remember, but mid-October, we had some really cold temperatures. We had some very warm temperatures before it. We then had some very cold temperatures, and then it warmed up again. I mean, we went from 18 on October 18th to 84 on October 23rd. And that really prevented plants from hardening off as they should. And so there's going to be a lot of pruning of dead tips on a lot of our marginally hardy plants. I've gotten calls on yellow woods, sensation box elders, and a number of other trees that are a little temperamental uh, that are having either twig dieback or in some cases have died completely to the ground. But I would say damage like this is more common and, and just get out there now. It's fairly easy to see and prune off all the dead tips and help to restore those plants as well. And then I do have to spend a few minutes on emerald ash borer. Uh, you're probably all aware that emerald ash borer was confirmed in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, and then it was also confirmed in Sioux City and Dakota Dunes. I found it down there back in January. So essentially we've got that whole strip on the Eastern side of our state, which is very vulnerable to infestations occurring pretty soon. No, we haven't found it in Watertown or, or Aberdeen or any of those other areas, but you know when we found a little bit of north and we found it a little bit of east, it's certainly going to fill in in those areas, and I expect to see that. Areas where we have had a presence for five or more years, even the windbreaks are beginning to die. This is a windbreak picture I took last year in Lincoln County, and those are all the classic symptoms of emerald ash borer infestation. And in Minnehaha and Lincoln County, I can see this quite a bit. It's beginning to pop up a little bit in Union County as well. In other words, seeing the damage uh, that's occurring there. Right now, they're still in their overwintering chamber. Uh, I go out and monitor about once a week and they're still fairly tight in that little chamber that they spent the winter in. Now, what they've done is they've stretched out. They curled up like a cat for the winter and they've already started to stretch a little bit. And in another couple of weeks, in mid-May, they'll actually form the pupil stage, the resting stage, which resembles a little bit of the adult. And they'll stay in there until about the end of May. And then the adults will begin to emerge. Uh, the adults are fairly small. There's a kind of a good example. They do have kind of that little bronze uh, appearance to them. They walk a lot. They don't fly a great deal, but they can. They can fly up to 15 miles, but normally their total flight is about 100 feet. They are the original couch potato. They don't like to very, very far from where they emerge. So most of the trees are going to be infested are going to be in fairly tight clusters uh, for it. We are doing our emerald ash borer workshops right now uh, with uh, commercial applicators to show them the various products in that that can be used. We are only recommending people treat trees in the counties to which are being quarantined. So that'd be Lincoln, Minnehaha, Turner, and Union County. If you live outside those counties, it'd be a little premature to treat your trees. Um, I realize there may be some people in Vermilion that will ignore that advice, and I get it. I'm sure we're going to find it there in another year or two as it moves up the river. But you might want to wait until we confirmed it before you started treatments. And yes, if your tree had already become infested before we confirmed it, treatments will restore it very easily in those early times. Um, and uh, treatment window is really coming up. The leaves are just coming out. We need the leaves out. The best time to treat is once they leaf out till about mid-June. And that was when we get the most bang for the buck. Well, I've really been kind of a depressing talk here as my talks usually are the gloom and doom. Here's everything that's killing everything. So I wanted to end on kind of a high note here. And here it is. The Northern Sentinel honey locust. It's a relatively new introduction, but unlike many trees, this has been thoroughly tested for many years before release as opposed to being rushed out. This is a release from South Dakota not from South Dakota State, but from a tree in South Dakota. It's incredibly hardy, drought tolerant, uh, 
thornless and for the most part podless. You may find a few on it from time to time, but it has kind of an upright form to it. Uh, by the way, it really holds up well in ice storms and snow storms and wind storms. Uh, that we've had with this form here. So the Northern Sentinel honey locust developed from a South Dakota honey locust tree. Um, and it's readily available in garden centers and nurseries. I'll be planting about five of these in a planting we're doing over in Bryant next week. And that, and was able to get them without any difficulty at all. So if you're looking for another tree to consider in your landscape, one that's not being overly utilized yet, but one that's tough, and be growing in most of the area of the state, you might want to consider the Northern Sentinel honey locust. And so with that, I will wrap up my part of it and turn it back uh, to Amanda, who can introduce our next speaker. All right, yeah, we will move to Christine and then we will go to questions at the end. And if we don't get to your question this week, don't worry, our experts will either get back to you individually or we might answer your question on a future episode of Garden Hour. So I am going to turn it over to Christine and it looks like I can see your PowerPoint. Awesome. It, there we go, looks great. All right. Well, I'll wrap things up on a really positive note of who else is ready to garden. And I'll admit that to John's point about, you know, we're, we're going from winter to summer and now we're kind of back, you know, we're not sure what it's going to do. I'll admit that over Easter weekend, when it pretended to be summer for a hot second, I was ready to garden. And so was my niece. Um, so, and so was the cat because he knows that means tasty plants to chomp on and I'll have more on that in a moment. So it wouldn't be a garden hour presentation if I didn't show some form of picture of my niece or my animals and gosh, this presentation has all of the above. So, um, Rhoda did an awesome job of already explaining, you know, soil temperatures and some of those decision tools. So I do want to share if you're, you're struggling with that. Patients versus planting. Um, I've been very busy both um, on campus with my graduate students. Granted, they've been doing most of the work here on campus with our greenhouse, but we have a lot of plants that have been started here on campus in our greenhouses, but um, I don't have a greenhouse at home. I have a second story apartment with a bathroom with good shelving and a door that shuts to keep the animals out. So that is where I start my seeds. And I just wanted to share with you all that um, I kind of took a took an average of the things I needed to start earlier versus the things I could start a little bit later. And so I looked at all of my seed packets, a lot of our flowers and some of our herbs are a lot slower to germinate. And so I started those for my target date of planting outdoors in eight to 10 weeks. I started those on March 12th and things that are a little bit quicker to grow, um, Peppers and tomatoes were in that April 2nd planting date. Um, those, those crops were started a little bit later. And I'm learning things like hypericum berries or St. John's wort, if you will. That should have been planted 12 to 14 weeks ahead of time. So I'm probably not going to have that to put out in my raised beds this year. So I need to share with everybody that my planting dates are based on raised beds on a second story balcony that's sheltered from the north wind with a concrete pad as a heat source. So there are ways to maybe look at your garden or think about those microclimates if you're getting antsy to sow seed or get things started. So I um, direct sowed radishes, carrots, beets, Swiss chard, spinach, and arugula on April 8th. I think the radishes germinated like three days later. The carrots are just starting to pop out of the soil. Um, and what you can see in the photo on the right is radishes. I love growing root crops in raised beds. Um, you're not dealing with soil compaction. You get really nice um, root formation, nice long straight carrots, as long as your raised bed is deep enough. If your raised bed is only four inches deep, you might wanna plant some short squatty carrots. Um, there's some nice recommendations on carrots for containers from University of Wisconsin-Madison. They have um, the trick with our root crops, especially carrots, is you would want that shorter tap root. You wouldn't want the 12 to 14 inch carrot unless you have really deep raised beds. Um, and really, as we think about direct sowing these crops, carrots, you're seeding them very near the soil surface, like a quarter inch deep, if that. 
So honestly, the trick is keeping that soil watered, especially on these days where we've had, today we had a red flag warning in Brookings. So soil is drying out really quickly and it's blowing away. And sometimes a little bit of that carrot seed might be going with it. So I have seen people use the burlap sack method where you um, gently lay wet burlap sack over those carrots and you keep that wet. Um, and that's a way to provide a little bit of a mulch or some moisture retention for those carrots. But once those carrots start germinating, you wanna pull that um, burlap sack off right away. So again, I was um, more eager to plant than I was patient. I do wanna take a little sidebar for a bit of SDSU history. I was lucky enough last, um, last fall, someone dropped off um, some seeds that they had saved and wanted to share with me because it had come up in a conversation. Um, and it was for the Bonanza tomato. And I knew that it was from SDSU, that it was an SDSU introduction, but I didn't know much about it. And so I asked my colleague, Connie Candy, and she shared with me that um, Paul Prasher would have been the person who developed that tomato. And this was 40 plus years ago. So I did some quick digging on openprairie.sdstate.edu and looked up Paul's name along with the Bonanza tomato. And sure enough, from 1983, I found a vegetable varieties for South Dakota guide with a description of the Bonanza tomato. Um, and Connie let me know that she really enjoyed it. And the person who lent me or gave me the seed let me know that they really enjoyed it. And the seeds are germinating and I've got transplants that are about three to four inches tall already and are, are looking really good in my indoor bathroom plant production area. So stay tuned because I look forward to updating folks on um, how those tomatoes are doing. And I just wanted to highlight that I found an article from 1993 that was a peer reviewed publication that listed some of the other SDSU introductions. Um, I have been asked about Rushmore before, have not been able to find the seeds. So if anyone on this um, Zoom meeting tonight happens to have seeds for any of these SDSU introductions, shoot me an email because I'd sure love to hear from you and see if you wouldn't mind sharing some seeds with me. Um, it would be really fun to start demoing some of these. And Rhoda and John, I look forward to, if, maybe if we don't have time tonight, but I'd love to discuss um, if you know more about these vegetable varieties as well. So stay tuned for photos of that. Um, it's been a long winter, which means I have a full out house. So those are all the transplants getting started under the lights. Know that there is typically more light in there because it looks a little dark in that photo. So there are those bonanza tomatoes in the yellow circle. Um, and I don't know about anyone else, but I accumulated just a few house plants over the winter. The arrow is pointing at the first house plant I ever had in my office, which was a euphorbia from Dr. David Graper. And I counted the plants in my office and I recounted because I didn't believe the number, but I am now up to 35. Um, so just some things to note as our days are lengthening and our house plants are going to start actively growing, you might be watering them. You know, they too are kind of coming out of a a dormancy period or a lull in growth, if you will. Um, so pay attention to watering. They might be drying out faster. This would be a great time to um, consider using a weak fertilizer solution on all of your plants. Do any pruning, dividing, check for pests. If you're planning on bringing any of those house plants outside, do so slowly. Um, make sure, especially if they're tropical house plants, that um, temperature, night and night temperatures are well above freezing and put them out in the shade first and kind of reacclimate them to full sun conditions. Otherwise, just like we do if we go out in the sun and start running around without sunscreen on that first warm day over Easter weekend, you're gonna get a sunburn, so will your plants. You'll have scorch on those leaves. So if you have house plants that you're bringing outdoors, do so intentionally. And also remember, the angle of the sun is changing. It's getting steeper. Um, so light that, you know, might have reached the back wall of the office or the back wall of the house when the sun was lower on the horizon, um, those plants might not be getting as much light anymore. So consider, you know, just like we think about spring cleaning, also consider some spring cleaning for your house plants and where to position those plants. And in the interest of being able to ask or answer some questions, I think we're going to pause there and I'll pick up with the rest of my slides next week. 
All right. Yeah. Apparently we all had a lot to talk about <laughs> since having been off the air for most of the winter. We do have a couple, well, we have quite a few questions and we've got about five minutes. So I did post the link in the chat to the problems and solutions page. There's an ask extension widget on there. So if you are somebody that had a question from tonight and we don't get to it, feel free to submit your question that way as well. And it will get to sort of all of us and we'll assign it to the expert that can answer it. So I'll start sort of at the bottom here because this is the easy one. Uh, somebody's asking about managing vol damage and we're just gonna punt that one to next week. John already volunteered to answer vol questions and I know we've had a lot of them over the winter. So if you wanna hear about voles, make sure to tune in next week. Another quick one. Well, Christine, I saw that you'd flagged the straw bale one. Do you want to hit that one real quick? Um, I want to start with the, the attendee is asking I, um, about straw bale gardening and is there research to support this? The answer is yes. Um, it's not total poppycock. There are ways to do it, but you have to be intentional. So I'd like to spend a few slides on that next week. So I'm going to I'm going to cop out so that we can dig into it more next week. Awesome. And John, the remaining three questions are all tree questions. So do you want a planting one an ash borer one or another planting one? I'll do them all. First okay. of all, uh, if you want to <laughs> transplant uh, Black Hill spruce, get the soil temperatures at least to about 55 degrees. We're getting close to that. And then it's a good time. Get it in right after that while the soils are warm, warm enough to support roots, but cool enough that they're not transpiring a lot. And then best time to plant quaking aspen and maples, same thing. And you can wait until fall too if you want. By fall, it'd be just after Labor Day, but either get it in fairly soon or, or wait it out. And then finally, if a company's treated and tagged a uh, ash borer, but tree's a buckeye, it happens. Um, <laughs> what should I do? Um, I'm not sure what you can do. It's not your tree. You might want to just let the homeowner know that it appears to be misidentified. But unfortunately, I won't say it's common, but it happens. And Buckeyes and Norway maples and for some reason can tell us. And uh, hackberries are often confused for ash. Don't know how, but it happens. <laughs> Great speed run, everybody. We've got about two minutes. Any closing thoughts as we go around? Rhoda, anything to keep an eye out for for next week? Asparagus is up in my yard. So if you haven't checked yours, go out and check it. Ooh. All right. Christine, closing thoughts. I would say just keep your eyes peeled for tulips. I know McCrory Gardens is gearing up to announce tulip palooza, so stay tuned. And I'm starting to see daffodils on my walk to and from work. So um, enjoy the spring blooms. They're they're going to start popping. Awesome. And John, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, the last one I would say is that I'm already getting things people are finding growing up in the woods or that. Uh, fungus in that. It's a little early, but in the South, I'm getting some. And with the picture in the question, can I eat this? Now, the answer <laughs> to that question is, of course you can. The, uh, the question is, will it harm you? And, and a, just a reminder here, we are not going to identify mushrooms from a picture. The only way to really know it is go out with an experienced mushroom hunters. Truly, this is not something to do from Google or from a picture. <laughs> Yep. Good advice. We would like you all to be around, you know, next week so that we can answer more of your questions. <laughs> we need the viewers. <laughs> we need the viewers. We need the ratings. <laughs> so thank you everybody for joining us for our first week of the 2023 garden hour season. We'll be here every Tuesday, except for the July 4th holiday at 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain on Zoom. And you can always catch the recording later on the SDSU Extension YouTube channel. There is a Garden Hour playlist. Check out some of the resources in the chat real quick before we close. But extension.sdstate.edu is where you can find all of our contact information. So thank you again to our panelists and to our Extension EdTech host, Evan, in the background there. It's been a great week. And we will see you all next week. Happy gardening.